Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, and I want to thank Lisa for hosting us here. And I want to thank you, and Betsy, and everybody that's been keeping this place going. And uh, I think maybe we you'll have something to share a little later, just to update on how things are going. And sure. you're keeping the doors open, and that's amazing. Yeah. So thank you for that. Doors aren't closed. No kidding. Uh, I also want to thank Bill Holiday to start with BCTV, and if anybody went to Brattleboro High School, you know Bill's been teaching there for one or two years, and continues to do a great job working with our, our kids here. Here he is doing some more for BCTV, and I want to thank BCTV for all they're doing to help share what's going on around here. Uh, and I want to thank the secretary here, and uh, are you the deputy recognition? So, um, we'll start with a primer on what all that means. All right. <laughs> because it's very confusing. One of the things I appreciate is it's not just the, the agency of commerce anymore. It's commerce and community development. And what we've been working on very intentionally here at Putney is continuing to grow the wonderful community we have here. And about a year ago, I sat on the, the back porch of a JD's here with a group of other business people. And the sense was that uh, there's some good things happening. We have a beautiful downtown here, like a few other places in Vermont. Um, but a lot of businesses are treading water. It's like there's a lot of people out there working hard just treading water. So the question was, what can we do? What can we do to, to hear what's going on and, and try and connect, connect the dots to see if there's more that can be done to help local businesses here? That's why we're here. So. Without further ado, I want to introduce the secretary. And uh, after that, what we'd like to do is hear, hear people, people's stories around here. And that's what we can do. Great. Thanks for having us. Maybe we can uh, just do initial intros, and then we'll talk for you know, five or seven minutes and just give you a little background on what we've been doing for the last two and a half years. And then you can make this as, as interactive as possible, if that makes sense. So I'm Mike Sherling, I'm the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development. And in my intro, I'll do the, the quick primer on what that means. In state government, typically an agency has multiple departments in it. And a department, um, so an agency has a secretary and a department has a commissioner, usually. The Agency of Education has no departments. The Department of Public Safety, the Department of Public Service, and the Department of Labor are not within an agency. So it just sort of depends where they've been situated. But in our case, we have three departments in the agency. Uh, Department of Economic Development, where Joan is the commissioner. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, where Josh Hanford is the commissioner. Katie Buckley, who's from this neck of the woods, just departed that position a couple of months ago. Uh, and the Department of Tourism and Marketing. And so we have a, a large portfolio of various things, but a relatively small department by state government standards. We're uh, just under 100 people, you know, so it's it's not a uh, it's not a big organization. So I'll leave it there, and we'll do the intros and come back to what we're doing. Um, Joan Goldstein, Commissioner of Department of Economic Development. As the Secretary said, it's a small department by state government standards. We have about 20. Lost count of 23 people, um, and it's a variety of programs that we have to help businesses sustain themselves, grow, uh, as well as the granting relationship with the regional development corporations around the state, of which Adam Quinnell uh, is the is responsible for this neck of the woods. And I'm happy to talk about any one of those, but um, would like to hear a little bit more about what what you all do, so that we can tailor the conversation. I'm Kate Bowen. My family owns a farm here in Putney, Putney where I grew up, and we're looking at expanding our pasture meats to a national audience. Uh, Charles Dodge, I'm sorry my partner and wife can't be here. Uh, we run Putney Mountain Winery and the uh, basket and the retail part of the house. And Jane Paul Renouf and I uh, uh, do spill response uh, all over New England and the country. I'm J.D. McClain. My wife and I run J.D. McClain's. Howard Fairman, private citizen, Putney. I'm Stephanie Gordon. I'm 
the executive director of downtown Brattleboro Alliance, uh, but I also own Duo Restaurant and The Lounge in Brattleboro. Two restaurants. My name's Jim Johnson. My day job is working as a lender for the Brattleboro Savings and Loan, and my part-time volunteer gig is being on the board of the Next Age Arts Project here in Putney. Billy Strauss, I live in Putney and was one of the co-founders of Next Age, which is across the street. Uh, currently the interim executive director of Next Age as well. Hi, I'm Olga Peters and I'm a local reporter. I write for the Commons. I'm Todd Harlow from Harlow Sugar House, trying to keep another generation going. <laughs> Uh, Mike Ross, I have a small uh, optical engineering business in I'm Kate O'Connor, and I am the executive director of the Brattleboro Area and Chamber of Commerce. Hi, uh, Adam Grimald, the executive director of the Brattleboro Development Corporation. I'm Nader Hashim, one of the state representatives for Wyndham Floor, district mate for Mike Nowicki. I'm also going through some wicked allergies, so if I don't talk too much, that's mm -hmm. half the reason why. Um, you know, now it's now it's the summer. I'm currently working at a law firm in Brattleboro, and prior to that, I served as a trooper for seven years. So, and also, I'm really glad to see such a great turnout to this event. This is a lot of people by Wyndham County students. By any more standards, I'm Lisa Bertazian. I'm the with the Betsy Mathiser co-managing this store uh, for the historic Putney uh, Historical Society. I'm also uh, on the board of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And, uh, my other life, I'm a historic preservation consultant. Working on projects all over the world. I'm Doug Grant. I live on Main Street here in Sunday. I'm a climate activist, and uh, I came from California to be a constituent of Murray Sanders so I could work with his energy and natural resources staff advisor. Paul, well, I'm a Brown Grove reformer. All right. Great. So, a couple and a half years ago, um, actually a little before that, because uh, the Joan is, uh, is actually a holdover from the prior administration, because she did such a great job. We said, hey, you should probably stick around. Um, we arrived, and Governor Scott's um, priorities for the administration, whether you're in uh, the Agency of Commerce or the Agency of Human Services, or no matter where you are throughout the enterprise, are three things, economic development, affordability, and protecting the most vulnerable. And of course, we are at the crossroads of a couple of those things. Um, what we did when we arrived at the agency was we took a look, and you're going to find this hard to believe, but government's really good at studying things and creating reports and doing process. So when I arrived, I inherited a desk that had lots and lots and lots of paper on it. Uh, what we did, rather than try to reinvent the wheel and do a new planning process to figure out where to go, we just looked backwards for 36 months and looked at all of the reports and surveys and things that we could find, really without digging very hard. We came up with 143 reports that informed strategy in the three primary areas that I mentioned, economic development, housing, community development, tourism and marketing. We put them all in a database, we pulled out the common threads, we held a community engagement process, we did an internal engagement process, we refined that down to 10 things, we then took those 10 and we refined them down to five by taking some of them and nesting them inside others. Um, so our areas of focus have five things that we're focused on that exist underneath those three priorities that the governor has. Uh, they're not gonna knock your socks off, they're pretty much common sense things. They're the things that you would think if you spent five minutes putting things in a bucket, you'd probably come up with the same things that these, this 143 reports came up with. So 21st century jobs, business growth and recruitment, um, housing for all, ensuring that we're, we're creating housing stock that works for all Vermont communities, and that differs a little bit in each place. Uh, vibrant regional economies and ecosystems, what that means is there's 251 towns in Vermont. They can't all be downtown Brattleboro or downtown Putney. The question is, what is their place? How do we help them identify and then resource um, finding their identity and being part of a regional ecosystem? And the way we define those ecosystems is by looking at a drive shed around the 10 places in Vermont where there is a disproportionate number of jobs 
you could name those 10 places off the top of your head. Brattleboro is that place nearby. Uh, but Brattleboro, Bennington, St. Johnsbury, St. Albans, Burlington, Middlebury, uh, Hartford, et cetera. So those 10 places, if you drive, if you map a, a drive shed around them of 20, 30, and 40 minutes, you capture all 251 towns, sometimes multiple times over. So you may be in a drive shed that uh, has multiple places where you can drive within that 20, 30, or 40 minute drive shed. So how do we help communities like yours identify um, what's your place in that ecosystem and how to thrive uh, as a piece of an ecosystem? without the state telling you what to be. That's you know, the important distinction. Um, sorry, I got off on a tangent there. How many of the five did I get to? Jobs, uh, housing. Four. Rural economies. Business, <laughs> Great business growth. Business growth and improvement. Ah, yes, marketing. Telling Vermont's story. So what's Vermont known for? What's Vermont's number one export? I do this in many ranges. Maple syrup is the number one answer, so if you're playing I can never remember the name of that show that used to have Richard Dawson. Thank you. If you're playing Family Feud, 98 people out of 100, you would have won that question. That's not accurate. Milk? Microchips? Milk? Microchips. Microchips is number one. Technology all in actually dwarfs agriculture. Agriculture is number two. Uh, all in. So all of our agricultural exports are number two. Um, but Vermont is very well known for our maple syrup. Now we don't want to detract from that. We're also very well known for tourism and having uh, great outdoor recreation and great small communities and all kinds of different things. The challenge is that's not the only story of Vermont and those things only partially resonate with young people today. They still resonate with some. But in order to be successful and recruit and retain population and workforce, you have to sort of branch out a bit in messaging. So that the challenge is how do you market Vermont in a way that balances those things that we are very well known for and contribute to the quality of life in a really definitive way with the fact that we are also incredibly innovative and we've got um, a variety of really high-tech, high-speed uh, businesses around Vermont, I'm guessing, like the one that you run. Um, the largest cookie cutter manufacturer, we believe, in the world is in Vermont. Very few people know that. Uh, aircraft engine parts are manufactured in Vermont. Uh, pick a thing. The, the, uh, the microchips that sent the Apollo missions to the moon were made in Vermont. We don't tell that story as effectively. So marketing is that, um, that fifth piece. So that's the general strategy. And then I've Joan filling some more fun and excitement from where she sits. So um, one of the biggest departures, I'd say, of the last uh, year, at least, is typically when people hear economic development, they think about economic developers going out and recruiting businesses from out of the state, right? That's typically what we hear. In fact, when we get critiqued, um, people criticize and say, well, you shouldn't be recruiting people from outside the state. And like, well, newsflash, we really spend about 80% of our time on expansion of existing businesses, the organic growth of our existing businesses. We don't have the wherewithal, the largesse to compete with other states to go and do that level of recruitment. What we do do on recruitment is really for our neighbors to the north, um, the Canadians who want a foothold in the U.S. That's been predominantly our business recruitment strategy. The departure has been that we are now recruiting individuals. The number one issue facing the state is really the aging of population, um, the, the lack of workforce, or the shrinking workforce. And so that was a major departure. I mean, I don't know if you followed it, but last year the legislature approved this um, remote worker bill, and the governor signed it into law. And even though we were already embarking on a publicity sort of tour, if you will, in terms of getting the stories out and making sure people knew about Vermont, there was nothing that compared to the level of media interest in that story, whether you love it or hate it or think it's a dumb idea or a great idea. The acknowledgement that the publicity value was tremendous, more than we could ever, ever hope for. And as a result, people moved to the state. Now it's hundreds, not thousands, which is what we need. And so we are keeping up that effort, and this year, at the legislature, we went back and asked for a new worker incentive because it's not enough to help 
remote workers who are working for out-of-state companies, but what about all of you who need people to work in your businesses? And so the legislature approved and the governor signed into law in late June the new worker incentive program, which will begin in January of 2020. And that program will pay people $5,000 to move to the state uh, to work for a Vermont employer. And they have to prove residency and um, we think that will help. Now in other areas, Putney may be one of them, I'd have to look at the chart, they could earn up to 7,500 because we want to make sure that this people move into the state or moving into areas that are outside of Jindon County. So that's like, that is a big departure. When I say departure, I mean for years the department did the same thing. I don't want to minimize what they did, but you know, we, we have an incentive program for businesses to grow, it's called Veggie, we have other programs to help, but this is by far the most innovative um, in terms of actually attracting individuals. So we hope to do more of that type of work. We also want to engage the employer community to really hear what your challenges are and how could, how could government help in, in integrating that effort. Um, I could go through more of our programs, but I kind of want to know what is on your mind. Is that, is that appropriate? And before we start going around, uh, Ted Brady just came in from the office. Um, Ted's not a stranger here. I think you were here when we rededicated this building after the second fire here. So uh, Ted's been helping for a long time, so I appreciate you coming right in. Now, what, what do you do for the agency now? Sure, so I'm the Deputy Secretary, so I do whatever Mike tells me to. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I have a few little areas that are uh, mine. I, I serve on a few boards on behalf of the agency, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, uh, the Vermont Working Lands Enterprise Board, the Northern Border Regional Commission. So I try to help bring uh, uh, some resources to the state and to communities like this to do some great things. And uh, also the Chair Emeritus of the uh, Vermont Council on Rural Development, which I know many people around here have been involved in. Thank you. That's the great connector. Yeah. And there are donuts now. Alright, one of the things I'd like to come back to is marketing. So we'll put that in the parking lot now. But there's a reason I'm wearing this shirt. Yeah. Because this is the cornerstone of the marketing effort. Thinkvermont.com. Um, not to put anybody on the spot, uh, but is there anybody who wants to, to share a little bit about what's happening for their business and what they think might help? I asked to if you speak should identify yourself again. I'd like to make sure I get the quote in right. Sure. And I, I will say it is very unlikely that you're going to find a thread to pull on that we have not heard repeatedly over the last two and a half years, or that we've not scanned the national landscape to identify as a challenge for rural communities. Um, so that's not a reason not to share it, just don't feel like you're going to be out on a limb somewhere. Um, that's very unlikely. That can include complaints about state government if you want. <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that we ever hear that. I can start with a. Share your name again to start. Uh huh. Um, I'm Stephanie Bonin, and specifically talking right now as the owner of Duo Restaurant in the Lounge. And I just, in, uh, often in these discussions, we go really big. So I thought, let's just start with really small. So labor is a major issue and one that stops us from opening the doors and has since day one. And one of the things that irks me every time is when I'm taking my time to walk through the aisles of the Vermont Rite Aid going liquor shopping. And I think to myself, why on earth am I spending my time buying bottles of liquor at retail prices? So just go, like really minutia, if I had a magic wand, that we would change it to the systems other states do, where it's distributed like wine, distributed like beer. I'd like to answer that. <laughs> yes, you second that. Not, yeah, not only that, uh, J.D. McClymon, not only that, you can't, you have to write a check. Yeah. Okay. Insurance. So you can't use a credit card to get maybe a Perk Airline ticket over the year for your uh, 
that if you're late, it changes during the month as to what it's due. And so, therefore, we were late once, and we were charged $300 fine because we didn't get it there on time, which is like, um, come on here. This is, a, this is about enough of my involvement and you not really understanding what it is to buy retail and then try and make a profit and, get, and spend your time as, as you say it. So, like, come on. Can I make sure I understand? Uh, I want to understand the issue when you say buying retail. So you have to go as a restaurant owner. Correct. I have to go and buy just the same as you do a bottle of Bar Hill vodka. Yeah. Retail price. Yep. And then I take it back to the restaurant and I charge. Whereas in other states you have reps that are teaching you and teaching your staff about Updating it. you. They're telling you about sales and then you're buying wholesale. There's no liquor dis dis there's no liquor distributor, okay. black and white distributor, or beer distributor. Correct. Can I speak to that? I'm a manufacturer. Uh, and so I hope that my friends here uh, know our products. Um, yeah, Vermont is what they call a control state. And what that means is that the liquor game here is very different than it is in other states. New Hampshire is also a control state. And the businesses in New Hampshire buy retail as well. But for most states, like New York, I suppose, and Pennsylvania, and maybe not Pennsylvania, that's State. But here's here's something that, that you can take back to the state government. My wife and I were at the Liquor Control Commission uh, last week because we had some business there. And of course, we were while we were waiting, uh, we started looking at the brochures. And one of the brochures that the Liquor Department puts out is about being a control state. And one of the things that's proudly uh, explained in the brochure for the control state is that we do not encourage the sale of liquors. We know that. Man, you know, this is a state that needs some revenue, and we don't encourage it, and we, you know, of course that's not true. They do, and they say we don't put things on sale, and that's not, it was a, uh, they were hedging on, on a few issues, but the main point they were trying to make is that uh, we want to make money, but we don't want to sell anything. Yeah. In other words, if we can fine you $300 for being late, fine. But if we uh, have to sell a bottle of bourbon to somebody, well, that's really bad market. Too bad for that person. You know? um, can I also understand? So, in, in doing that, you have to pay by check. I want to understand. Yes. They, you can't charge. No. You have to pay oh, you by can check. charge, but then you're charged tax. Yes, yeah, tax uh, on top of it. Yeah. Uh, you can charge. That you're charged tax on the purchase, just like any individual sales tax. Yes. We don't pay sales tax if we write a check. Gotcha. But of course, you know, it all comes back to you in our meals and rooms. And that's the same with wine and beer. There's no terms. Right. So yeah. you have to be cash heavy. Right. And you have to pay at the moment of the delivery for the distributor. And the uh, late fee was just, uh, do you know if you can explain that yeah, again? We have, we have Overlooked it, overlooked and the license. No, the meals and rooms. Uh, oh, meals and rooms. Yeah. Oh, well. As far as the licensing go, I, um, in the 15 years, uh, the state allows you to pay it twice a year or once a year, whatever you want. So the one year we decided we're going to pay it twice uh, every six months. Well, we overlooked that. And so I go to Rite Aid to purchase the alcohol, and the woman that is like the the mega horn of Rite Aid announces at the door that we can't sell you alcohol. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what are you talking about? So one thing, next thing is, you know, if you have something to say to me, please don't announce it to the store. And she said, your license, you don't have a liquor license. And I was like, what do you mean I don't have a liquor license? You know, the state notified us, do not sell you alcohol. Oh. I call the state, find out we overlooked the second payment, which I don't have a business, so I don't have a liquor license, so there's obviously an oversight. So I race up to Montpelier, on, it's on a Friday, I can't basically open on Friday. So I race up there to find out what's going on, and it was an oversight, and I paid, and, and it was like, I said, why is it that I didn't get a notification? And she was like, well, and she hesitated, and was like, well, we haven't figured that out yet. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, you have figured out how to call Rite Aid when you have every information about me. You know everything about me. 
and you can't contact me? You have the email, you have my phone number, you have everything. She said, no, you wouldn't believe how bad it is here. And that was at Department the Liquor Commission. Liquor Control. Control. Yeah. Yeah. Liquor yeah. How long ago? Um, it was last year. Last or the year before. Okay. It's like, I it was, it was like, you don't, I wouldn't have said that. I would have made up something else. <laughs> lie, lie to me, don't tell me that. That's Are you okay if we talk to them about that for you? <laughs> That's why I'm here. All right. Yeah, absolutely. I just don't, I don't mention my name, put but you yeah. on the spot. What's that? I don't want to put you on the spot because. No, it's, it's, no, it's a, a true story, and I, yeah. Yeah, I'm here to tell it and defend it. So, they're going to hear from us. Barbie? They'll hear from us. All right, good. I just want to add. It's just difficult. You know, it's difficult yeah. enough here. Well, it's hard enough it's to not, run a business. Yeah, small business. it's hard enough to live here. We don't want to make it hard. You know, it's not easy living here. Yeah. It's not for the weak hearted. I think plenty That's of stories sure. about the inefficiency <laughs> of that particular business. Yeah. I, I wanted to uh, talk to them about listing a new product. And uh, I was, uh, which I submitted in mid-April, I was told that we had to get it in by the 10th of April, so we couldn't do that particular month, but uh, I was told that they would put it on the agenda for the July meeting. So two days before the July meeting, I call up and say, what time is my appointment? Oh, we don't have you on the docket for an appointment. Uh, so they did. After, you know, I had to go and, sh and send them the email that they had sent to me that said that they would uh, put us on the docket in Germany, and they did, and, and it worked out fine. But uh, that was a lot of uh, what, blood pressure that was pretty unnecessary. I think you have to recognize that uh, in the United States in general, people like to drink. Um, they go on vacation, they want a drink with their meals and things like that. Um, we don't have, you know, a lot of states that allow for um, TJF Fridays, things like that. We're not allowed to do that here. But we can do it, but then we have to charge that cheaper price throughout the entire evening, which would have a real negative impact on us in the long run. So, I mean, lack of a happy hour. Yes. Yeah. And our liquor sales as a restaurant, and Duo, I'm sure, is, I mean, all the restaurants are the same, which I think restaurants are probably your almost number one business in the area in terms of how many there are. Um, we, um, we can't have people come in and give them special deals on liquor. Even though we have to pay this full price for the liquor, we can't somehow try to make that up. And liquor sales, we make much more money on liquor sales than we do on food. So Vermont, you also have to have a certain amount of food you know, with your meals, which can be any kind of food. It doesn't have to be good food. But we do have to have that aspect and element of it. So um, my feeling is that the general lack of support for restaurants and the amount of different certifications, and licenses, I mean, uh, you know, an outdoor consumption tax because we have a debt. Uh, I, I, it's a list this long of things. Now, it's $50 here, $100 there, but it's but a lot never, of money. And, sure. and, and I don't never feel we get a lot of support for that amount of money that we have to put out. Um, on the same lines, but in the, my capacity with DBA, we put on and everyone puts on tons of these different festivals throughout the year. And the particular one that I'm talking about brings in people like Charles and others, spirits, distilleries, and we do tastes all around the town. And it's a phenomenal thing for in the heart of winter, February, raising spirits. It, it, it actually raises some money for DBA. We're able to do publicity. And the answer I get when I call up is, I don't know if I have enough permits left. And they have to judge whether they're going to participate in something based on 12 permits in the year. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the actual number. Um, and so I plead with you to just increase the amount of permits so that number one, they can get their products out because they don't have distributors, and number two, so we as communities can benefit for these incredible makers being in our, in our communities, bringing people to our communities. Legislation. Legislation. Yeah. So 
I was just asking if that can be done by rule or legislation. Uh, sometimes agencies have to have under their uh, charter, they can do things by rule. It sounds like we would need to pass some legislation, so we'll put that on the list. There was some modernization done with liquor yeah. legislation this last session, yeah. but it, was, it didn't fix all of the potential challenges. So just to add, Stephanie's here because she works in Brattleboro, has a restaurant in Brattleboro, but she's a constituent. She's, she's here in our district. That's right. <laughs> the liquor control has improved over the years. We, we got our first license in 1998. And uh, that was Andy Kazuki. Now they're, they seem to be trying to catch up to uh, sort of uh, what, what people expect of liquor in the 21st century. They're trying. But it's always it's a tremendous time. Lisa? Um, I, I have a question. I, I, I'm not going to remember the name of this program, but I was at the Welcome Center, uh, Gilbert Welcome Center, and I noticed a promotional program about like farm to table, uh, a map of the state, and you know a lot of materials, and you know basically you know directing people to various sites that are not just makers of food, food products, but also purveyors. I think, and I was thinking, okay, how do we get on that map since we work with a lot of local and I'd love to know more about that and whether it, how it can help some of our restaurants and stores be part of what seems like a very great marketing you know idea because that is Vermont is doing great on those fronts right now in terms of um, making great products that are becoming well known. Is that put out by farm to plate? Is that the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund? I'm just wondering. How I think long. it might be actually the uh, fresh. Uh, fresh network. Fresh yes, network. That's, yep. that's what it sounds like. It's, yep. is, that, we, is that ag? No, it's actually an independent organization, yeah. an independent nonprofit that puts those together. We work with them. The Vermont Fresh Network is a partner of the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing. And so if you are, if anybody is interested in getting on that map, we can certainly facilitate that conversation. I don't know what the rules are and restrictions off the top of my head, but we'd love to help facilitate that. And, Does the uh, state do anything like that? That? Yes, the Culinary Trail, which is under development for the uh, Department of Tourism and Marketing. Um, it's not fully completed yet, but the idea is a, a culinary trail that actually goes through multiple states and provinces. The, um, I know that you want to get back to marketing, and maybe this is an opportune time. I mean, one of the uh, other legislative initiatives this past year is a small amount of money to go out for regional marketing and regional workforce recruitment efforts. So they gave the agency $80,000 to um, develop a program. We haven't done it yet, but it's it's definitely gonna be done this, this fiscal year, where um, if individual communities have an idea about how to market, perhaps let's say get all the restaurants and, and purveyors onto this type of a map, that could be one idea, others, I'm sure you know Adam probably has ideas about what uh, could be done for the whole Windham County region. So that'll be forthcoming, and, and that'll help you know in terms of marketing because each region has their own particular um, unique qualities that they'd like to present, and we want to support that. Well, we should probably give you the landscape of how that came to pass. So what we proposed, what Governor Scott proposed in January, was a two and a half million dollar recruitment, relocation, and incentive package for new Vermonters uh, and for marketing Vermont. And what we crafted into that was a million dollars in marketing. Uh, to date, the largest amount we've spent in a, in a year has been to a quarter, $225,000 in economic development marketing statewide. So what we proposed is four times that, with half of that spend, half a million dollars, going out to communities to develop local or regional components of that marketing strategy that dovetailed into the state's overall strategy. So not, the idea is, you know, don't create a one-off that sits by itself, but create a fabric of uh, marketing and storytelling that weaves together all the components of the state. What ended up being funded was uh, $450,000, which in total off the million, so that's not too bad. And 
uh, another eighty thousand dollars in uh, these regional marketing grants, which are designed to do what we suggested, which is to dovetail into the statewide strategy. So we're in the process of developing the programs around all the things that passed uh, in May. But in terms of policy or possible policy changes for Department of Liquor Control, some of those changes that were uh, that were affected this year started out in kind of forums like this where people were complaining about particular issues. So I think, I'm not sure if it's a phone call or maybe another forum, but now is the time for us to tally up that list of these things and we've all taken notes on it, but we're wondering who should be point so that we could start having those communications with Department of Liquor Control. I don't, I don't know if she won't look at you. Well, you <laughs> could be and I sit on the, the government operations. Okay. So maybe something we can break that in. In your new role, uh, we'll probably see you we're really dealing with, with the marijuana bill. There's a marijuana bill? <laughs> I heard something about it, but I thought that was a rumor. Yeah. But not liquor. <laughs> For anyone who's in the dark about what he's talking about, in September I'm moving to the Department of Public Safety to be the Public Safety Commissioner. So you'll get uh, Commissioner uh, Curley from the Department of Labor is coming over to the agency to support Ted and Joan and others. So, but I mean, what I'm envisioning after this is I'm going to try my best to kind of collect the, this list and then I just want to be able to, uh, yeah, verify that I've captured everything. So here's a question that comes up to me. So we've got apples, blueberries, raspberries up the road here, you know, about three miles. We've got a bookstore here. We've got these other things. How do we get to help people know that's up the road here, the bookstore's over here? Um, I think one of the challenges is getting people off the interstate um, in a way that will share all of this information. Are there apps that are being worked on? Yes. Like Waze? Or if you um, do a search for the Vermont Community Atlas, you will come up with a project that we have started that is designed to do exactly that, to map all kinds of different assets. Its primary mission to uh, is to create uh, a portal for folks that are looking to relocate either within the state or to the state to know what's around. Um, it hasn't taken off as a substantive piece of what we're doing yet. Um, it's all dependent on like user generated content. So like Waze or Yelp or any of those things, which really, you know, I, I've seen individual businesses sort of, you know, offer some sort of referral payment or something to get them to talk to their friends about about the different businesses. Um, physical maps, uh, probably not as useful, although people do stop at Guilford and, and pick up pamphlets. Um, you know, that might be another initiative, a kind of a marketing initiative that could be funded. You know, I know that the Brewers Association has an app on you know, a phone about the breweries throughout Vermont. Uh, I don't have their usage statistics, but we could, you know, figure that out. I mean, a lot of that content on the web is right now disaggregated, meaning it isn't so much about you going to a particular portal to find everything you need, it's really this whole user-generated Facebook likes and, you know, people generating reviews of their own accord. So I encourage, if you don't have that or don't have that presence, to to at least start that um, so that people can, can find you. What might be interesting is, so the Department of Tourism and Marketing had, uses digital metrics to measure the efficacy of the things that they put out. So we spend about $3 million a year in tourism. Uh, marketing, we bring in, the state in total brings in about $2.8 billion uh, in tourism revenue annually. Uh, we can tell without specificity, so we don't know exactly who the person is, we're not tracking individuals, but we can tell that a particular platform was displayed on a device and someone pulled on the thread that was presented by that platform and then we converted that person into being a visitor because they came to Vermont and they spent this number of days here in such and such a place. It would be interesting to start taking that backbone and beginning to weave in 
some of the local efforts like what you're talking about, and we can start to see the well with some of these dollars that uh, have been allocated this year to, to figure out how to mesh those two things together. It, it really is, it's, it's using those digital platforms to know, it, it's what we're going to do around uh, recruitment as well. We're not going to spam 360 million Americans and say, come to Vermont and live here. We're going to identify who's got a drop of Vermont in them. They left to go to school, they left for a job after school, they used to live here, they have family here, they're looking at real estate here, they're visiting here regularly. Identify those folks and then place messages in front of them on digital platforms and give them the opportunity to pull on those threads. So the community here could present those threads in a way that says, you know, come to Putney, come to this area and here's the array of things you can experience within uh, a 25-minute drive of here, bookstores and uh, distilleries and uh, general stores and all, you know, all of those assets. And you really do have the ability now in a well-crafted campaign to target people who uh, the, the conversion rates are going to be much higher than just blanket spam mail. Lisa, did you have a question? I had a couple of I, I would say, just following up, advertising dollars are really expensive. And for a small business like this, or many small businesses, it is just be out of reach. And knowing where to spend the few dollars we have, I mean, I don't know. And I don't know how to navigate Yelp, which drives me crazy. Because we have no control over these platforms at all. But, you know, and I would, I'd love to know how to answer those Google phone calls. If the state has any um, resources, like literally advice on, you know, this is this is the best way to get the best uh, bang for your buck out of Google or Facebook, or I would love that. You know, I would love to tap into that advice, or and also whatever the state can do, or how we can plug into, you know, regional marketing. That's huge for us. I mean, we do have a group down uh, businesses in Putney that got together, and we do have a little money. But again, you know, knowing where to spend that money most effectively, yeah. we go around in circles talking yeah. about that, and we, yeah. it would be yeah. really helpful to. No, we need help. We need, right. we need the state to like yeah. Yeah. bigger, bigger thread to for us too. Know about the programs. Yeah. See, right. I haven't heard of any of this. Okay. You, you have all these platforms, and you're gathering all this information, but you're not giving it out to the people that need it. Like, I wish I had known about some of these things. <laughs> You know, I didn't, you know, uh, why would I? Yeah. I wouldn't even know where to go and look, you know? It's, it's endemic of the same problem. $3 million is a pretty limited spend, yeah. both to tell Vermonters what's going on and to tell the external audience what's going on. It's by far the lowest tourism spend in the Northeast. And there's email platforms out there, that single platform thing, you know, that you, you could put all your things on the list with all your people, and I, I just don't think that would cost all that much money to we, notify us. Yeah, we actually do that. There are our, our listservs for uh, for tourism, for Think Vermont, ambassadors for economic development, all on our websites. It's how you get people to know that they're there to subscribe to them. It, it's this it's sort of a circular challenge. Yeah. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It's really hard to do. Important to know. Um, notwithstanding your legislators that are here, there is a general skepticism about marketing dollars in the legislature. We are on the defensive annually about the small spend that we do have, which all in is three and a half million, including economic development marketing. Um, should we be spending 20 or $30 million like our neighboring states? Probably not, but somewhere north of where we spend, the, the return on that investment is substantial. If you use remote worker as an example, um, for each worker that we're bringing in, uh, the average award has been $3,680, even though the maximum is $10,000. That's less than a one-year return on investment in taxes. So every person that's moving here as a result of that program, say what you want about whether we should be targeting those dollars to existing Vermonters or out-of-state Vermonters, it pays for itself immediately. There simply is no way to uh, continue to afford to run what we have to run to maintain our infrastructure with the number of people we have. Growth is not an option. No. We have to grow. Do we so, have all people in our budget? I mean, it, what, you know, 
the youth. I mean, what's going on with that? That shouldn't be like that. I mean, it's a small <laughs> it's thing. The youth yeah. is here. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying, though, the people that are making some of these decisions that are being made, you know, it's like you're not going to get young people to come here if you don't start advertising the things that young people are looking for. Yeah, I actually, I wanted to speak to that. Um, regarding the whole recruitment and retention idea, I actually wanted to hear from folks about what you hear from you know, younger families when they choose to leave your business and go to another state or the difficulties you encounter with, um, with trying to recruit people. Because I mean, when I talk to my friends from college, I always try slipping in into the conversation, you know, when are you gonna move to Vermont? And there, there are a lot of wonderful things here, but I think one of the other questions is, you know, like you were saying, is how do we advertise these things to people to get them here? So you know, I was wondering if there are any thoughts on that. So uh, I just want to kind of add to that, even though I can't answer your question specifically, just so that everyone understands the state. We are also learning. We were not. We are not social media experts by any stretch. And the point that Lisa brought up is such a good one, and it kind of dovetails into what what you were saying. Is that you know we that small spend we can't just mass market. If, you know, Vermont's an acquired taste in a way, right? Um, so we have to micro-target and make sure that the people that we're going to serve up ads to are likely to convert, right? So it, it takes a lot, right? And when we first were given, this was years ago, we were given $200,000 to do economic development marketing. Everybody, everybody had ideas about what that should look like, whether it's ads or slogans or pamphlets, you know, and we really had to hire a professional to, to, that does place marketing to guide us through that. And any marketing plan has, you know, paid media, earned media, but you really want to figure out how to spend it. So part of any effort might be, the initial effort might be to get that plan in place. And I also wanted to just address some of the communications issues, like if you please go to thinkvermont.com and sign up for our newsletters, and I'll also leave everybody with my card to make sure that we have that communication going. Um, just, just because I, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that. I feel bad that um, none of none of you are knowing exactly about what the state is doing in terms of its marketing plan. You know, we have a Think Vermont Ambassadors Program, which we email out good news to people, and then they act as ambassadors and share that on social. That could be a really good platform for small businesses yeah. to get likes and to get people to come to their websites or, or what have you, or just increase awareness. I mean, the very first step is increasing awareness, then we'll work on conversion. But we are we are learning. We, we are, this has been an iterative process. We have more money than we do, so. Okay. Yeah. If you don't have a lot. <laughs> but yeah, and then the idea is to team up, so sorry. Adam, did you have something more? Sure, it's specific to the marketing, but I think I want to just step back a little bit and just say, you know, probably most folks who, who have, uh, know the DGCC, Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, um, you know, we're not specific to Brattleboro, uh, and until recently we didn't really have credit, um, so it's just sort of a bad name in that sense. Um, but we are the, the regional economic development organization for the Wyndham region. We actually have a few towns outside of, of Wyndham County. Um, so back coming out of the flood, uh, we partnered uh, with our friends in Bennington County. Um, so it was the uh, Bellas Falls Region Chamber of Commerce, Brattleboro Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Brattleboro, Downtown Wilmington, uh, Mount Snow Valley Chamber, Bennington Chamber, Manchester Chamber. And we wrote the EEA application for Southern Illinois Park. So this is, is not really had a big strong support uh, up until this past year. We really saw it gel. We got a USDA uh, grant for all those parties to come together and start to develop some collateral. So that could be an opportunity for a low cost way in which to communicate. Um, we're really looking forward to some of our tourism uh, entities to really drive that message forward. That's something we do specifically for our organization. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there that that exists. Uh, as well as just talk about some of the things that are within that, which is the targeted expertise recruitment <laughs> attention program. Um, that's in partnership with the state that really is trying to find ways to communicate what we have available here in the region. Um, one of the other things people know uh, about the ECC 
see is probably that it's working with large industrial uh, projects. But we're also doing a lot of small things. We're, we're working with a lot of people in this room. We're working, uh, you know, Hutton's a great community in that we're partnering with right now about five entities within a half mile radius where we sit, um, trying to support small business. Some of the challenges are access to capital. Uh, you know, we, we've got some great banks in the region, but we lack uh, national banks. So sometimes a business lacks that access to capital, or they're at a the very small scale, micro entrepreneur alone, and they can't get at that access. So we're trying to develop partnerships and collaborations to make sure that people get the money they need um, for small businesses as well as nonprofits. Uh, so I think it, it really does take uh, knowledge and understanding. I mean, you're not sure what the state is doing, but you're also probably not aware of what we're doing, and, and that is just a can never communicate well enough or enough. Um, and that's something we're really focused on. So hearing these comments, um, I think it's, it's going to help us in, in fine-tuning what we do. But again, for a, a local newsletter, um, Federal Development Credit Corporation would go to that website. There's about 3,000 people. We publish it every two weeks consistently. That mentions all of these state programs. Try to bring in what the legislature is doing, trying to create that communication hub. I should like to praise the people who handle economic development uh, in this area, and I'll address myself to you, Mr. Greinold. Uh, you folks from the state may not be aware of the extraordinary work that was done to finance the rebuilding of the Brooks House in downtown Brattleboro after the disastrous fire. The same uh, innovative financing was applied to uh, uh, making sure that Long Falls Paperboard in Brattleboro stayed open and is now being exported to Bennington County as the model for financing the, the reconstruction of the Putnam Block. Uh, there's, there's some very interesting things going, down, uh, going on down here in the far south of Vermont, where we, where, where we here were known in the north as the Banana Belt. Uh, and, and you should take heed, because they certainly are applicable to elsewhere in Vermont. Absolutely well said. Thank you for that point. Um, Adam uh, and, and his colleagues have done a great job down here. Um, the state fully supports those projects that you mentioned through brownfield programs that we have for redevelopment, um, our incentive program for employment growth. I mean, we usually work in conjunction with the regional development corporations to get bring those things to fruition. So thank you for that. Um, Billy or Jim, I wonder if you can speak to the, the arts economy across Vermont essential part of what we're doing. And what you've done with the church over there is just amazing. So I know a bunch of us know this because we live here. I don't know if you guys are aware of, have you been across the street ever at Next Stage? Do you know what that is? Okay. So that was, and Lisa was very instrumental in this project too as a historical society partnered with this group of us that eventually became Next Stage Arts Project of which Jim is currently the board chair to convert the church into a 200-seat state-of-the-art theater. Um, we're now we're technically entering our 10th year, I guess, but that's some creative chronology, I think. In reality, we completed the big renovation four years ago, five years ago, and something like that, um, that converted the space from being a church to being a theater. And it has become, um, and JD's been also very involved since the beginning as coming in and serving beer when when you know before we had a license to do so. And, um, I think the project has become a hub for the town in, in some sense and, and we're working on making it a hub for the broader community and southern Vermont in general and I'm listening you know intently to this because one of the challenges that we faced or, or and that we kind of assigned ourselves was to be very in service to the local community and we continue to do community suppers, which have happened in that church for decades, um, and other kinds of very Putney local events. Um, we now have a commercial kitchen in there, which is used in various ways by the local community. But at the same time, we have a very regional and actually sort of you know, broader kind of national ambition in terms of where a project like this sits in the national dialogue around creative placemaking, which has to do with 
leveraging the arts to build more vibrant communities. So we have worked, what that means on kind of a day-to-day -day basis is we worked really hard to bring in people to town from Brattleboro, from Northampton, from Amherst, from up north, and from points east. And we, and we can track with some accuracy where our audience is coming from for various events, and it's undoubtedly true that when we are doing our best, we are pulling people from pretty far away to come to Putney to see shows. Um, and for us, that's a huge success, and as we work to try to bring artists of more regional and national renown into town, it's of course crucial to be able to draw audience from further afield. But the marketing piece is always a challenge. Um, how do you market to those people? How do you, you know, what can we, are we collectively doing to make Putney and Southern Vermont a destination for great arts and great entertainment and great food and you know how do you bring people here once and then get them to come again um, and I was thinking about this also in terms of you know getting people to relocate to Vermont is kind of the end game you don't get them to relocate here before you get them here to do something fun and have a great meal in Brattleboro or Putney or wherever and see a great show in an awesome 18th century building that is the 19th century building that's now a beautiful theater. So, you know, we're trying to keep our eye on the big picture, but it's, you know, we have to pay the bills, we have to have the doors open, and it's a very, the P&L is a very tight one, and we're very frugal, but, you know, we're constantly trying to think about ways to partner with other organizations in the county and the community to bring great programming that will attract people to Putney, and I, I think um, I think it's been working. But it's you know it's a long it's a long game kind of process, and we do face you know I'd love to have next stage on the sign out on Main Street because you know GPS doesn't really work that well. Like just, just to go back to Stephanie's point about like here's an uber local nuts and bolts thing. The number of times we've had people coming here for the first time from points further afield and they put in 15 Kimball Hill and they end up like way the hell up in the line. I don't even know. Like some, and uh, you know, it'd be and great. Next to where our deliveries end up. Probably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of stuff is, you know, it's sort of funny and it's kind of, you know, it sort of speaks to the character of where we've all chosen to live. But when you're actually in the moment of dealing with an irate person who's yeah. probably coming to town for the first time to see some great artists and they're stuck way out in the wilds of Westminster while the show is starting, it's not that funny. Signage is a huge issue for us too, which, yeah. you know, having a sign even down off the exits, just trying to get, like, it's all directional signs. I mean, I don't know, but that seems like a tourism thing to me too. Believe you it know? or not, there's a thing called a travel council, which doesn't have anything really to do with travel other than signage, wow. which I am supposed to chair, but it's so technical that our lawyer actually does that for us. Um, I, I was actually told just a day or so ago that the only thing more political right now than Act 250 is signage. Uh, yeah. So I would love to our respected colleagues in the legislature for assistance in how to modernize. Yeah. There have been drafts at trying to modernize the statutes that govern um, this council and the way that signage is done, and they run into, uh, I do not have this personal experience, so take it with a grain of salt, because we haven't tried in the last 18 months, but historically they run into a buzzsaw um, when they get to the point of King well, why don't we? Uh, I wonder if we could collect a list of the signs that you like. Let's create the wish list. It doesn't mean we're going to get everything, but let's create the wish list and understand more what the process is and the why nots. Because it doesn't, you know, we looked at some data point that showed us that on Visa charge cards in the, in the winter months, 80% of the meals and rooms revenue that the state gets are from the four southern counties. That's astounding. So we need to have signs. <laughs> so you know, I think I think sense. we can make a compelling argument. I just I don't know the process. So it's drive shit. People will drive up to six hours 
to do their tourism. You're within six hours of, I don't know the number, I, I knew the number last year, it's tens of millions of people. Mm -hmm. On, on signage, uh, and this is, you know, you know, we usually start the conversation about economic development or community development by saying the state's not going to come in here and solve it, right? This is not how we as Vermont have created our community and economic development network. It's very distributed, which makes it really strong. However, it takes grassroots action to really change something. We've seen some towns do some really cool wayfinding projects involving the creative economy too. You can do some really neat signage projects. You need to germinate the idea down here and bubble it up and we will champion it and fight for it so that the regulations don't accidentally buzzsaw it down, right? So if there's a, I could see some really neat stuff talking about coming off the exit and in downtown here that would really add to the character of this community. And, and we are in a designated uh, village center, correct? Yep. Which I'm guessing you folks in the rehab use some tax credits. I know we did, we did here. Yes. Um, and, and so that village center program, Richard Amore and Gary Holloway, right? The two smartest people in community economic development in the state of Vermont work for our agency. Uh, we would happily have them come down and actually convene a conversation about village sign signage and village wayfinding. That would be a really easy thing for us to help move forward. I also want to talk about the creative economy. We talked, Joe and Mike and I are really proud of that uh, worker incentive that we're putting out there because it has attracted literally billions of eyeballs to the idea that Vermont's open. Over two billion media impressions. Mm -hmm. You know, be. really cheap marketing to get that many people sit hearing Vermont's open for business. It's a long game. Yeah. The creative economy, the rec economy, uh, you go down a long list of things that are that place make, it's a long game, right? We've been trying to make this place the best place to live, work, and play for 60, 70 years. Joan pulled out a pamphlet, actually, from what, what was the year? I think it was the 1950s. And guess what our tagline was? Great place to live, work, and play. <laughs> so, they were doing that in the 19th century. Yeah, in the 19th century, right? And if you go to thinkvermont.com, you're going to see just modern versions of those panels. <laughs> yeah, but the, the point there is it is the long game, and the creative economy is all part of that. The outdoor rec economy, which we're all in on, the governor's all in on this Vermont outdoor rec economy uh, collaborative, this all is part of making it attractive for people not just to come here but to live here. If you're attracted to live here, people will want to come here. So we, we're with you. And what you're doing uh, at Next Stage, right? Did I get that right? Uh, what, a, what an amazing piece of rural community economic development. Uh, just on the sign issue, this is something I, I hear a lot in working with some of the tourism communities down the region. And one of the pieces that they're really struggling with is the wayfinding in that now we all have ways or what have you. People are going on back roads and going around communities that used to get the traffic. So in Wilmington and Mount Snow, people are coming over nine and going through Higley Hill. And they've requested just a sign that says ski resort with an arrow to stay under nine versus going through a dirt road in the back way. Uh, and the state can't do that. So it's not only specific signing for businesses, it's also to make sure that people don't just follow their GPS, missing part of what has traditionally been a drive through Putney on the way to wherever they're headed. They can easily be going around town. So I think this is, if, if you're taking notes, John, I'd happy to participate in gathering sign yes, input. That would be great. Yeah. Well, selling a promise to some uh, Putney folks, I am here today to talk about uh, signage. And uh, this is a very brief open letter to uh, you, Secretary Sherling, uh, regarding uh, this matter. Uh, fortunate that I-91 exit four is at their town line, Dummerston and Putney businesses certainly can benefit from official business directional signs. At the northbound exit, uh, official business directional sign placement is routine. At the southbound exit, however, there is insufficient distance between I-91 and the U.S. Route 5 intersection. 
I understand that OB, OBDS placement is discouraged or prohibited at such an intersection. So I take the liberty of suggesting that your agency explore waivers for community development OBDS placement at I-91 exit 4 southbound and similar locations in Vermont. Now I've also looked into the nitty gritties here, and this is more for Putney folks, exit 4 northbound. Uh, as I mentioned, placement of these signs there is, is routine, and yet there are only two. There's one for your establishment, J.D. McClymouth, and there's one for Landmark College. That's it. They can have three on a set of posts, so one is available. And I've plugged this to several Putney businesses that have, since several months, done nothing about it. It costs $75 a year, first year $175, because of, they charge you for making the sign. So this is something you could be doing. There's room for, 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 for several more of these three sign assemblies down there. Uh, Exit uh, 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 southbound, I've mentioned that. That's something that you folks need to deal with to get us some kind of waiver. Now, at, at wh wh where the roads actually come out on Route 5, AOT southbound has put up a sign saying uh, uh, gas, food, information, and lodging, 20, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and camping. Northbound, the sign only says, uh, 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 let me see here. Yeah, uh, the, the sign only says uh, lodging and gas. Uh, now, information where? Uh, apparently, the information is supposed to be at the Putney Park and Ride, but it's not there, at least not yet. Nobody seems to have done anything about it. There are six free level one electric vehicle charges at the Putney Park, uh, uh, park, park and Ride, uh, which uh, people would stop. It takes a while to charge your car on one of those. People would stop in Putney off the interstate if the drivers knew. We need, we need a sign for that. And by the way, each of those six has two outlets, so potentially one can charge 12 cars at once. Everybody is promoting electric vehicles. Here's an opportunity for Putney. Putney has opportunities of which it is not taking advantage. Yet another one is the new sidewalk being built to Landmark College. There's about 550 students up there who have money to spend. And it's, it's soon going to be, uh, within the next, uh, about by Labor Day or so, they're going to pour the cement. It will be much easier for them to walk, to, and safer for them to walk to Putney and back. These things are available to you, but we do need help from the state regarding that southbound exit where there isn't any, the, the interstate is so close to Route 5 that there's no way to place the signs before the exit. We need to have signs at the exit. And there should be a way to do that. Of course, an alternative is to have a state information plaza at the Putney Park and Ride and have a sign simply saying, go to our information plaza. And among other things, you can, you can charge your vehicle there. There's a lot that can be done. I like it. And the thing that just came to mind is we mentioned the community atlas. We don't have significant traction. With one of those signs that on the three sign Holder is a, was a link to the Vermont Community Atlas that can then pull up Putney, and mm -hmm. now you have all the businesses represented there. So we actually have so the actual Putney. like that we're on that sign. Yeah, all I mean, all you do is you get folks to put their business onto the atlas, and then okay. the link at and you can do this at each exit is. Uh, for local information updated regularly, uh, visit VermontCommunityAtlas.com. Um, we could, eat, yeah, with, I don't want to overextend our very small tourism and marketing crew, but what would we, one of the roles I think we can play is, is this aggregator that uh, Joan's talking about, where w what if each community had a thinkvermont.com forward slash your community name, and now you've got specific information in a platform that looks like all the other platforms um, that uses the current technology to be able to get your, your message out. So thinkvermont.com slash button. Um, and all we have to do is create the mechanism for you to be able to populate that information. That, that role of sort of facilitating the progress and giving you a platform that's easily reproducible is something that I'd like us to be able to do. So if we have a business with all seven of the staff that's in tourism and marketing. So there is a Putney Business Alliance. So it has a website. So is that something the website itself that could be on the list? It all the yeah. It, it could as a first step. But and I need to check with our folks to see if I'm making sense because I'm not a marketing professional. But in the event I'm making any sense, 
it could start out by thinkvermont.com slash Putney just redirects to the site that you maintain. There's no need to, mm -hmm. to go it's somewhere else. I will say, two years ago, I printed out the application for signage. And I am used to bureaucracy and filling out forms. And I just like, forget it. Mm. It took us forever to get that sign. We were so discouraged to get that sign. So and when I addressed the problem of what about the southbound traffic, they were like, well, um, well, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> and so I said, what about if I put something, because I'm a quarter mile up the street from town, people come into town, come to G's door and a few other places, they don't know I'm up there. So can I put a sign on Main Street? No. Why? What's that application go to? Yeah, because, yeah. 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 Okay. because because it's a no directional turns. sign and it does not change. When you see my sign, it's an arrow this way. So you don't get one on Main Street because you haven't changed direction. So let me take you down a, a, a parallel road to the things we've been talking about, just so that you're aware. Um, governor's got three primary priorities. Sitting next to that uh, is government modernization. And it's a slow process. Um, but so I, I will observe at a macro level, you have over 13 cabinet members that we get together every week for at least an hour. We, our systems have grown organically to be so complicated that we don't know how to navigate each other's systems to say nothing of the ability of, of everyday Vermonters who aren't in government every day to be able to navigate those systems. So we are actively working on modernizing the way folks interact with government and the systems themselves. And it, it, there, it, there has been progress, but there's much more that needs to be done. And I'll take this opportunity to, to mention permit process improvement, not just for signage, but for overall permits for development is one of those areas that we're actively working on trying to make it more navigable, less duplicative, less costly, and more predictable. The most important thing being predictability. That you know if you do X, Y, and Z, you can get to the end result. Uh, the modernization of Act 250 is one of those areas that is going to come around again during the legislative session um, that we think is incredibly important. These opportunities to modernize something that substantial uh, don't come around very often. Um, this kind of goes to our thoughts around um, the, the ecosystems and marketing. No one is talking about modernizing Act 250 in a way that is going to be detrimental to the landscape, to our um, to ecology, to the things that are critical to maintaining Vermont's identity. However, we do believe that there are ways to modernize the process to remove barriers, to remove duplication, and in some cases to just get Act 250 out of the way of development in the areas where it makes sense. In our downtowns and village centers, along our major thoroughfares and corridors, in industrial parks, at state-owned airports, places where it makes sense to encourage development that will help communities grow and be sustainable and simultaneously will not add to the cost burdens of running that infrastructure. So there's two ways to look at this. If we continue to do 10 acre parcel development, which is what Act 250 incentivizes, every time we have to build a new road, another mile of water or sewer or fiber infrastructure or telephone, we're upside down as soon as we build it. It costs more to build than you get in return for hooking up a house that's every half mile. Now that's not to say that that can't continue to occur on a case by case basis, because that's what some people want. But we should be looking at ways to incentivize more clustered infill development because A, it's what both our young people and our aging demographic are saying they want, that's what they're telling us. It is more sustainable from um, an environmental perspective, it's less footprint, and it is less costly to maintain the infrastructure. So we have this unique opportunity to modernize uh, and not this is not a conversation about how do you do away with Act 250. It was a brilliantly constructed land use strategy. It just needs to be updated to bring into balance the need to continue to develop and grow 
at a reasonable pace. No one's suggesting that we're trying to get to 1.1 million people like New Hampshire, 1.2, whatever they're at now. But we do need 5, 10, 12,000 people a year just to fill the yeah, vacant jobs that we've totally got. Totally critical now. to the survival of our mind. So my I'll end my diatribe on Act 250, but that is an important piece of what's going to be talked about starting in January. And part of the discussion that's ongoing here yes. for our town too. At the same time, we're looking at what's sustainable, um, what what's green development, uh, what is in fact helping us address climate change, and, and more clustered downtowns, and villages are, are really the way to go. Yeah, I, I left out you know the, the decreased need for transportation if you've got people aggregated in a, in a downtown or a walkable area, and it's. Again, we're not trying to say that's the only way to develop in Vermont, but there are a variety of case studies that say at this point in time, those are the things that make the most sense to look at. And incentivizing that and getting some of our, our bureaucratic permit process uh, out of the way um, would probably be helpful. I just want to add one more kind of nuts and bolts piece to the thread about modernization and the importance of the downtowns is interestingly enough across the street and Michael you'll you'll sort of laugh at this maybe a few years ago a group of us spent a lot of time trying to get broadband internet coverage up to one piece of Putney that had been mysteriously kind of left out of the rollout and we got through that with Mike's help it took a few years the broadband availability right where we're sitting now super limited which I've only kind of reacquainted myself with because I'm in this role of interim executive director of the theater. And our security cameras in the theater, we can't run them all day because they suck up too much bandwidth for anyone else to be able to do anything on the connection. So as a result, we only run them at certain times of the day, et cetera. It's not optimal. Anyway, just throwing out there that even all these years later, I was really shocked to learn right in the center of downtown Putney, within a stone's throw of the interstate, there's really only one provider offering broadband here. And you kind of have to have a t cable TV subscription. And what, I, what I would put out there is... Um, it's a statewide problem. Yeah, I know. I'm and, just mentioning it. And what we did... In the last session, and, and this is uh, this is a plug for what I think we need to do as a town, yeah. um, we made a law that will allow us to create municipal utilities. Uh, it's clear that the companies that could serve us are not. Yeah. And, and we're at where we were with electricity in the last century. Yeah. So these, uh, up in Norwich, EC Fiber is now serving 20 towns in that area. That, I think, is the model that we need to look at. What we need to do, what this legislation says, though, is we need to work collaboratively with other towns. So what we're trying to do moving forward is, is arrange for Putney, Dummerston, Westminster, maybe to get together um, to help create the kind of uh, municipal utility that I think we can depend on. And, and that will serve everybody. I think that's the only way it's going to happen. It's just one of those things that, and I think Stephanie, who's maybe not here now, sort of said at the beginning of the meeting, we kind of gyrate between the real nuts and bolts, low level, what it takes to have the doors open every day kind of issue, and then we end up on very high level discussions about, you know, Act 250 and how the genesis of Act 250 and how it's going to be interpreted and maybe improved and modified going forward, and that's really important. But these bare bones issues, whether it's you know being able to buy liquor at wholesale if you're running a restaurant, or you know I'm trying to hire a new executive director from out of state, maybe <laughs> trying to attract one of those people here, and I don't want to have to explain to them that the reason they can't get on the internet when they're here for their interview is because well we have this whole funky thing in Putney and we're not quite up to speed yet, and so I'm just trying to. Yeah. What's frustrating yeah. here is. There, there's a, a large trunk that runs up yeah. five yeah. that we're not tapping, being able to tap into right now. And that's something we really need to hold to. So it's just a balance between Well, it was soft net to put it in, so first light is now. First light's only real business. They're not doing it for those connections. So 
what I want to say, I want to give a shout out to Harlow's though, because I'm in Brattleboro and I see a sign for Harlow's <laughs> on the side of the road. And I can tell you, there's nothing more effective. It's good to know people. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And that's one of the things, before we go, I want to talk about is how we can continue to build. What's, there's an alliance in here. It's gone up and down. And, and what I want to ask you folks is, uh, is there a way that there's some help to build some capacity here? Are there people? Um, and, and I know you folks are doing your work here as well, and we need to tap into that. But is there, is there anything else you know where, whether it's grants to, to, to hire somebody? Um, so um, I'll let Ted talk a little bit more about Northern Board, the Regional Commission. but. Um, that is a federal grant program that uh, just this year went statewide. It used to only be for the northern counties. Um, we just are finishing, in fact, today is the ceremony to announce the grantees, but a new round will be available in February. And you can get up to $250,000 or to $500,000. And typically the applicant is a nonprofit or municipality. And it could be used on a wide swath. When I say wide, I mean really you could get creative. Uh, we've done workforce development grants, we've done infrastructure, we've done marketing, you name it. Um, the object of the game is job creation and economic development. So I don't know if you wanted to add more, but I, I think of that as a great pot of funding um, because statewide, you know, everything is, is kind of spoken for. The other thing I want to just bring out, and maybe you already know this, but through Adam's office, there's the Small Business Development Center for one-on-one -on -one counseling for business. It sounds like today you were really focusing on the state-oriented issues, and there are a myriad and a number of them that's taken up the time between signs and liquor control uh, and marketing. But if there are um, you know, other, other things just endemic to running the business, the Small Business Development Council could be very, very helpful. And we fund that, the state funds that through legislative appropriation. Um, I don't know what else I'm leaving out. Um, I mean, there's, you could easily find a half dozen to a dozen grant programs that could help you do things that are about promoting your uh, businesses in this community. Uh, I think the bigger obstacle right now is what is it that you actually focused on, right? So is Discover Putney working on something? That they're ready to go to that level? Do you have another group? Is it a wider group than Discover Putney? I'm not sure. So you need to define what it, what what the what that one problem is that you're going to solve. Start small, and you know you can track down twenty to forty thousand dollars to execute. Uh, certainly, the signage issue. Yeah, that's. A, I think that'll be. A the starting point. So do we contact you? Is that? Well, this is, of course. Like your idea. Yes. Or, yeah. or do we just go to the small business development? I mean, I'm no, so the small, no, I think the, the question is, what is the problem you want to tackle first? And you as a collective group of small business owners in Putney need to define that. And then we have, we convene a conversation with some of our experts and help you build some sort of a work plan. And that's when we chase down some resources to execute that. And then yeah. that's, that would be my recommendations for our next step. The other recommendation would be as much as possible to combine with other towns. They really like sort of collaborative pulses. Okay. And I'm just going to say I represent the Brattleboro area chamber. We're not just a Brattleboro Center chamber. So if there's something that the Brattleboro area chamber, if you needed some, support, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to sign on, help you get signs or whatever anybody needed. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Mm -hmm. We send a lot of people, we are sort of like the tourist hub, mm -hmm. and so we send people, not just to Brattleboro, but up through 9, 5, 30. Um, so the, the other thing to participate in, if, if you haven't already, is the stay to stay, mm -hmm. um, because Brattleboro um, is, is one of the one of the locations for Stay to Stay. Last year, our Department of Tourism came up with this idea where um, as people visit Vermont, let's make them aware of all the great businesses that are here, not just for vacation purposes, 
although that's really good and nice, but also as a uh, prospective place for them to get a job and, and live. So if, if you're not signed on to that, there's usually a welcome reception and then there's an opportunity on a Monday for the visitor to visit businesses. So it's just another kind of um, networking this opportunity. Is We can help you. Yeah. I can give you my it's a, it's a state invented program credit to Wendy Knight, our just departed commissioner of tourism, um, but it's in partnership with communities, so it's really a great, uh, a great add-on in the last 18 months. Um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you, you no, no, I, I, I've been yapping a lot. I, right. I'll hold it for a moment. So I, I just don't want anyone to feel uh, left out. I just want to create an opportunity before we finish um, yeah. for people to talk about the agricultural community here. Uh, we know how interconnected it is with our restaurants, general stores, and co-ops. And I mean, I've met people who come to Vermont literally just to drive around looking at small farms. And so I was wondering if there are any thoughts uh, in that area, if anyone wants to share anything. Well, yeah, we just bought a whole bunch of blueberries from uh, Mr. Harlow in order to make more wine. So uh, there's uh, interaction not just with with uh, restaurants and uh, others, as you mentioned, but uh, the, some of the commercial uh, enterprises in the area also uh, thrive from the local agriculture. So, um, uh, I just want to, so Putney has been a, a long time supporter of Sabbaths annually. Um, so, Kate, or um, uh, Kate, your time manager, uh, Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, has been doing a great job um, in really communicating with us and bringing those resources in. Um, so I just want you to know about that. Putney is a, really has assets. And when you're thinking about economic development, you want to do a list of assets. What do you have uh, that can, you can leverage? Um, so you have wastewater. You have uh, some, some potential developable land right on that uh, wastewater. Maybe some brownfield issues, but the state has brownfield programs to help. We have the ability to, to understand how to navigate those brownfield programs, bring those federal resources to a community that can leverage that, that asset, which is your public wastewater. So, you know, we have those types of resources. We have the ability to help with some of the signage issue. Um, and importantly, we have a USDA funded community facilities program, which allows for us to develop community projects. Uh, that will eventually lead to some community, USDA community loans. Um, but we also have the ability to grant small projects out of those funds. So if there was a community project, um, I don't know if signs would, would qualify, but if there was a community project that a group came to us, a nonprofit, and said we're trying to advocate for this, we have the ability to bring a resource through R.T. Brown or myself's time and capacity. Um, but then we also have some dollars to grant out to hire someone from outside of the region to support that project. So just know about those things. These are resources that are available, um, and we're, we're always trying to find good projects to help advance to the next stage. So we do this really in, in support with the, the state. Uh, we're, we're, we can only do so much. The state can only do so much. Putney can only do so much. But acting regionally, acting together, you get to leverage those resources and build projects. That's so we're here to we're not the government. <laughs> okay, do we, do we, how do we get permission to do this? We want to put something on there in front of the co-op in that little garden right there. We want to put this way for this. That's, this way. Is that what you're saying? You could help we, us with some of this. But we have to get, I think, permission for someone to do. We that. can help communicate in that. Yeah, okay. Along the partnership. Okay. Yeah, that would so be good because us going, it, it just is the rabbit hole. You yeah. know, we get down there and we're just so, and they, they don't know, you know, so having somebody that's already identified the issues and treatment. In January of 2007, there was a presidential inaugural address that described the carnage in U.S. communities. In May of 2017, Thomas Friedman, who writes for the uh, Times, wrote uh, an op-ed testing that thesis and driving through central part of the United States through the Rust Belt to see if there was truth to the description that was given in January. And what he found is it's partially true. In places that have 
undergone an evolution and manufacturing has left and they have not identified what their new identity is and not bootstrapped their future, um, things were tough. But there were more communities that had determined what their future could look like and embraced the challenge of how to reinvent themselves and they were doing just fine. And I think that is the path that many Vermont communities are taking and many others could take because we really do have unparalleled assets, uh, a 240 year history of incredible innovation and a place where people generally want to come and whether they want to live here or they want to visit here, it doesn't matter as long as they're coming and spending a little money. Um, so there are all kinds of, of opportunities, whether that is trying to attract an anchor employer to be here, and by that I'm not suggesting a 2,000 person employer. Anchor employers in Vermont can be 100 or 200 people. Um, whether it's uh, being uh, based on a, a tourism economy, it's identifying there are communities that survive based on a single festival a year. There are others that have the attraction that everyone has to stop at when they drive through the largest ball of yarn. I'm not suggesting that necessarily, but the point is there are a variety of different ways to craft strategy that can draw people here. Um, maybe it's uh, a curated um, day in Putney, and you're, you're targeting folks that are headed from the 40 million or so people that are south of here to somewhere else, and you hook them by saying, we're going to give you a day uh, really cool stuff. You're going to visit a winery. You're going to come have breakfast at a general store. You're going to visit a local bookstore that curates these kinds of books. You're going to go see um, a historic um, wooden site that's down the road. W whatever that array of things is, and you make it this sort of all-inclusive uh, for X number of dollars. You're coming. You get to stay. You get to do all these things. And you don't have to think about it. We're going to show you all that stuff, and then you can go on your way to the next thing. I don't know. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's something that we've never thought of, but the, the bottom line is there is a place for all of our communities to have, um, to be vibrant and succeed. You just have to identify what it is, and it doesn't have to be replicating what someone else is doing. It can be unique, and you've already got the foundation because in a community this size, to have 20 people in a room, it's pretty rare. Can I just say one thing? really weird, but you just made me think about it. I just it. said a whole bunch of weird stuff. Wow, well, isn't it um, If the state, and this is something that could connect the entire state, if the state would do a covered bridge map, one of the things mm. that people come in your chamber and say to us is, do you have a covered bridge map? And of course, we keep thinking, well, we're not like the you know, Madison County, Iowa. But it sounds really, really stupid, but I can't tell you, so the chamber has put together like a covered bridge map of bridges around here. But when they go to the covered bridge on Route 30, we say, stop at the retreat farm, stop at Back and Hill's Chief, stop at Sex and Urban Distillery, stop at Fire Arts Vermont. So some people, I mean, this sounds really, really dumb, but we you know so many people that come and want to see the covered bridge. Yeah. And it brings them you know, like, around. to places like that. You know, they're not necessarily going up the interstate. Do they still make the official Vermont State Roadmap? Well, they have the yes, Vermont State Roadmap. They have the Vermont State Roadmap, but the little map, the little um, bridge coverage. is so minute that you have to have a, yeah. it's sort of like the map we were talking about, you know, farm to table. Yeah. Yeah. It's all so like the map we were talking about, you know, farm to table. So I just want to, I'm just going to say that you just said ball and yarn, I thought, covered bridges. Well, I, um, from just where I sit in the store, uh, we get a lot, I mean, I know what motivates a lot of old tourists. I don't know what motivates the young tourists, honestly. Brew tours at bars. Bars, <laughs> bars. you know, well, right. But um, what motivates a lot of uh, is stories, is narrative stories. And I can't tell you, following maps and trails, the, the Vermont, I mean, the general stores of New England, so many people come through saying, we're, we're hitting them all. You know, and or we just saw this thing on Chronicle, and here we are. I mean, that's a big draw for some of our people. The programs that Chronicle runs, um, people are, you know, okay, that's what we're going to do next weekend. Um, so these stories are really powerful narratives, and, and uh, 
And I just wanted to say with my Preservation and Trust in Vermont hat uh, on that um, that's an organization that also really tries to support um, village <coughs> economies through um, advice and trying to bring experts to um, struggling businesses and, um, you know, everything, you know, do working with what the state does too. But I also want to say that we kind of did all, we, we like did a lot of these, we checked a lot of these boxes. We did a whole economic development project with arts. We, we rebuilt this building to be the center of town again. And we are, and there are now, there's more, there's actually affordable housing town and town and more development, you know, people living in town. And we've still lost all of them. Yeah, in yeah, the storefronts. And I, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. And Amazon is on the board. Well, I mean, there must be a way of yeah. countering that in this very creative state. Well, there, there is. It's just it, it's finding the niche, the thing that you have to touch and feel and see that you're just not going to find on a. It's not a staple thing from Amazon. It is not just Putney. Downtown Brattleboro, which everybody is like, it's, it's a great downtown, but it's going through its own evolution. And there are lots of empty storefronts now. And I'm glad Harlow's is here because it, it, a lot of it is the next generation. We need the next generation. To Plus, I'll put a pitch in to the public safety commissioner. Hopefully, I'm hoping that the state keeps, you know, there's some of this is a quality of life issue why people are either living here or not living here or able to run a business here. But we're going through the same thing downtown, downtown in the Brad World. One of our challenges, too, is we've we got a piece of retail space just up the road here that's not being used. Is there some way we can create? What is that best? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're taking, we're going to take another, we're going to take about 4,000 square feet right. in the ground floor. Right. And I'm told that another business is, but it's not a retail business. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, Baskerville, I, I don't know who the biggest employers are in, in this town, but Baskerville is, is a, uh, a, you know, is an importer hey, of right, baskets yeah. now, and they, had uh, 20, 25 people working up there, and then the tariffs were imposed by the federal government. They had to let five people go. So it's not all controllable if it were Our time is starting to run a little short, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone who's had something to say here uh, doesn't walk away without get, getting their chance. So is there anybody who hasn't spoken that would like to say something now? Howard, did you have your hand up? Yes, I'd like to offer a couple of clarifications for you folks who are visiting us from uh, up north. Uh, first one is the arts scene was mentioned in Putney, but two organizations uh, uh, got overlooked. They being ne next door to next stage is Sandglass Theater, uh, puppeteers who perform internationally. They also have a tiny theater there where they let, where they let us see what they did in Europe and China and places like that. The other thing is, uh, you mean like pocket size? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, all sizes from as big as we are to this size. These are virtuoso puppeteers, and they're right next door for next stage. Wow. Sandglass Theater, Eric and Ines, ba uh, 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 and Ines Zeller Bass, and their their daughters, and some other people. Uh, the other thing is, regarding broadband, I need to offer uh, a clarification, especially because this is a public meeting covered by the media. Uh, it may be that Next Stage has deficient uh, internet, but it's not because it's not available in Putney. I live at the crest of the hill, less than a quarter of a mile away. We have consolidated communications residential service, 20 megabits per second, and an alternative provider in Putney for, for, for a commercial, they no longer serve residential, is First Light, formerly SolarNet. So uh, high-speed broadband is available in, uh, in Putney Village. Now, the farther you go into the country, of course, the, the more difficult it gets. But for next stage, uh, you need to talk to, uh, to First Light. I'll talk to you. Yeah. Or, or to consolidate communications. The other thing I want to hold up before we leave is, is to think about the, the next step here for those of us here. Um, 
I don't know if there's a regular meeting of the of the Putney business people. Well, I'm gonna yeah. There hasn't been. Everybody's yeah. been too busy. Yep. And we also ran into just issues. Yep. So, but I'm. I know, hope we can that we can reactivate that again and, sure. and hopefully. And, and let us know because Nader and I certainly okay. have heard a lot here yeah. that we want to act mm -hmm. on and sure. share mm -hmm. liaisons mm -hmm. with what you're trying to do. So we're all working in concert. Yeah. Um, I think that um, connecting with Brad O'Brien yeah. 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 is definitely yeah. going to be you. helpful because um, I think that's, we're, we're trying to reinvent the wheel and we just don't have time. Yeah. So, you know, being able to connect with some other people that have already done some of these things and going for help in different areas would, would help us be motivated and move on, you know, because we, we just end up being frustrated. So, you know. Well, hopefully we can. This will help. Yeah. We can help oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. I took notes on Yeah. Good. Um, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. Or Thank you for coming out and sharing your thoughts. And we uh, are very interested in continuing the conversation and uh, yeah. helping in any way we can. Yeah, thank you. This is tremendous. Yeah. I, I don't know how it feels, but I feel like this is tremendous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thank Mike. You. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're flying back. Flying and drive back to the airport. Okay. So, just the pilot here flew down yeah, from Burlington. Any opportunity to get an airplane? So, Vermont is even more spectacular than the air. Valleys were fogged in. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. The river's been. It feels like September now with the river fall. I couldn't see the river. <laughs> it's fall. Yeah. Well, thank you for putting your flying tent. Thank you for coming down. Yeah. Uh, Bonanza. Bonanza. Yeah. All right. And please take it down the hallway. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. 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 Are you going to leave a copy?